Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist Emeritus at the University of Illinois. Today we're going to present a topic that was presented at the 2012 Illinois Milk Producers Association Dairy Summit held in Illinois. The topic is feeding strategies with today's feed and milk prices. Certainly the key on dairy producers' minds in 2012 is profitability. I'm not sure our dairy producers can print money like I do, but certainly that would be one alternative. Today we'll explore different ways of looking at feeding programs to determine how to compete here in 2012. I thought looking back might be a way to start and then look to 2011 and look forward. Let's look back at 2009, a very tough year for dairy producers in the United States. The good news in Illinois that milk production in 2009 was up 5.1% and no change in cow numbers. I call that the Illinois advantage. Now why did Illinois not see the drastic drop like we saw in California, Arizona, New Mexico? First of all, we had ample supplies of forages and corn on the farm. The farmer did not have to write a check to buy this. This was not true in Arizona and New Mexico, for example. So we could buffer some of our costs. Next, most of my dairy farmers had not expanded, therefore had very small debt loads. The bankers were not demanding money. Next, herd size was 106 cows. So when losses were two or three hundred dollars per cow, obviously that's a lot smaller loss compared to say herds with three or four thousand cows. Another factor is family labor. As a result, we do not have to pay the actual fees demanded by a herdsman or other laborers on the farm, and families can hunker down or live a little bit cheaper and not draw as much. The typical draw, according to Minnesota researchers, are about $50,000 for a family of four in Minnesota. And finally, there were some government programs. Uh, there were some government payout programs, the milk program, which favors herds less than 150 cows. In Illinois, we were paid 50 to 60 cents per 100 weight for not using our BST. And a couple of our co-ops actually advanced some patronage, so it helped farmers get through this very difficult time period. So certainly, let's remember that. If things get a little tougher in 2012, maybe some of these Illinois advantages will fit on your farm. We look then to 2011, which is now over, and of course it was a great year. Average milk price in the United States, $20.14 per hundredweight. That's a really good milk price. Uh, the gross uh, mon money earned to 2010, which was an acceptable year, almost six, $860 more per cow. So actually we had a lot more money coming in in 2011 to work with. The good news, 13% of all U.S. milk was exported. So obviously exporting builds our marketplace and will be critical in 2012 and beyond if we expect to maintain stronger milk prices. We have a record milk production. You can see lots of milk, 196 billion pounds of milk to be sold, marketed, or exported. And the good news in Illinois in December, we actually saw for the first time a turnaround in Illinois. We are above the national average in terms of milk production, and we saw a slight increase in cow numbers. So certainly 2011 was very kind here to our Illinois dairy producers. Well, what does 2012 look like? Realizing this is the end of January and these will change from month to month, but you can see milk prices are softer. Down about $2 per hundredweight if we look at 2012. So certainly 2012 doesn't look to be nearly as exciting on the milk side of the equation in terms of milk price as 2011 would be. Another important aspect is looking at feed costs, and again, we can see modest feed costs, uh, corn in that 650 per bushel range, and of course, that will change next summer, depending on what the crop outlooks look like in terms of weather and acreages at this point. And soybean meal, pretty modest prices as well, and that's having huge impact by such countries as Argentina and Brazil. So it looks like feed prices are going to stay pretty much in the middle of the road. We're not going to see dramatic drops and maybe no increases. The real wild card, of course, is forages. If you complain about the price of corn in Illinois or Wisconsin, just look to our neighbors to the south and east. You can see that uh, if you think $6.30 high is, is high for corn, look at California at the same day and the same time, almost $8 per bushel. So certainly uh, where we are in the Midwest favors us in terms of some more economical feed prices. So let's look at some things. First of all, I call it, let's rethink and look at your ration strategies. Here are some things to consider. First of all, make the right decisions. And here is a list that has dollars written all over them. Maintaining a solid mineral program. And here I like to see them organic trace minerals, zinc, copper, selenium, for example, because it impacts fertility and really impacts animal health. Holstein heifers, the second or third most large investment on a farm, must be gaining 1.6 to 1.8 pounds per day. This is for Holsteins, of course, because Holstein heifers must grow quickly. They make no money until they enter the milking herd. 
If you keep your semantics all count below 200,000, first of all, our exports markets are going to be pretty excited. And second of all, that means you're going to get an extra two or three pounds of milk compared to those herds that are 400,000. So obviously that has a milk decision and a herd health component to it. We've got to get cows pregnant. Uh, pregnant cows are milk cows. Cows that have long lactations produce less milk. We've got to get these cows pregnant. We look at accelerated calf program. Uh, these are the programs that are feeding more like two pounds of dry matter a day versus the typical one pound of dry matter a day. And they're mimicking whole milk. Holstein milk, typically 26 to 28 percent protein. That's what your milk replacer has to be as well. The fat content will vary depending on the time of the year and the energy requirement of the cow, but typically 15 to 20 percent fat would fit in that category as well. Those cows calves on accelerated program fed at these higher levels the first six to eight weeks after birth will produce 1,100 pounds milk more in the first lactation based on both Cornell and Illinois research. Look at additives that pay. There are additives that pay back a 14 to 1 benefit to cost ratio. You got to look at those very seriously. And finally, look at low group. Uh, we've discovered that uh, even though uh, meat feed prices and milk prices may be modest and fair, uh, going to a low group allows us to manage body condition score and lower feed costs in those cows that produce lower levels of milk and are gaining body condition. I call these correct decisions that have dollar signs written all over them. Then next, listen to your cows. Every day your cows talk to you. Here's what they're telling you. Milky nitrogen or MUNs should be between 8 and 12. When you get over 12, you are wasting nitrogen. So certainly one a trademark to look for, and certainly you get this from your milk co-ops here in the Midwest. Next, let's look at protein test. You can see for Holsteins, 3.1% true protein, 3.8% would be for jerseys. Obviously, those cows below that produce less protein and have less value. In December 2011, protein was worth $3.34 a pound. January, it's dropped a little bit, but you can see protein has tremendous value. Butterfat test for Holsteins, 3.7. Uh, jerseys, 4.6. So if you're not achieving these numbers and you have Holsteins or jerseys, then I would say we are not capturing the genetic base in these animals. Fat typically in that dollar fifty per pound range. So certainly fat has value, but not nearly as valuable as protein. But certainly you and I can build a milk check by getting these components at least at genetic values based on Horde's dairyman. Management level milk at 150 days should be increasing. Management level milk simply means I'm looking at adjusting for the milk, such things as age of cows, days in milk, and uh, and the um, uh, components in the milk. We'd like to see that increasing slightly, which means the entire herd is moving up. If your management level milk or 150 day milk is dropping, that means that something's going on in the herd. Fecal scores, looking at manure scores, at least uh, we want at least 70% of the cows to be at the manure score three. Well, Usually the risk comes in manure score twos and ones, which are very, very loose, indicating something going on nutritionally health-wise in the herd. And if they're over three, usually means a nutrient imbalance going on. So fecal scoring, the cows de defecate every day, score them. Lambda simply means looking at those cows that are not walking freely. A, a lambda score of three, I would like to see less than 10% of my cows at three or higher. A four cow is actually physically lame. A three score actually is arching her back, bobbing her head, and not walking very comfortably. So I'd like to have 90% of my cows walking comfortably in the herd. So as we wrap up this section, certainly we look every year, we call the Hutchins 50-35-15 rule. Simply says that on average, 50% of what your dairy cows consume will be forages. Another 35% is going to be the grain or concentrate portion of it. Could be corn and barley and soy and canola and minerals and vitamins and additives. Then the last one is 15. The 15 rule says that's what's left over. This is what I call the swing dry matter, which means you can decide if that's going to be forages. So if you have high quality forages and digestible forages, then that's the way you're going to go because they're cheaper and usually available on the farm. Some of you in the Midwest will use byproduct feeds, corn distillers, corn gluten, very good economical sources, and others you will look at more concentrate. We have poor quality forages, then we have to make up that differential from our concentrates, and that will be a problem this year in 2012 because our first crop hay in many parts of the Midwest. And finally, of course, we're going to feed more forages to dairy cattle. Uh, this list comes from Larry Chase at Cornell University. Uh, reason we're going to feed more forages, you can see all kinds of reasons there. I'm going to pick number four, uh, a healthier rumen, which means healthier cow. So that, that's going to be a factor as well. And then the final bullet point I think is going to happen here in the future, and that is we're not going to compete for cereal grains. If I have a bushel of corn, and I can either use it for cornflakes or I can use it as ethanol, or I can feed it to my dairy cow or pig, 
generally speaking, we come in last. So the quicker I can get off the human plate and going to buy product feeds and forages, then the more cheaper I'm going to feed this animal and I don't have to compete those higher grain prices as we start seeing a bigger and hungrier world that's occurring in the next 25 to 30 years. These other factors are important as well, but certainly these are big factors when you look at on-farm forage use. And of course, in the Midwest, the availability on the farm and controlling that is huge. Now, in the southwestern parts of the United States, that would not fit, but certainly it does here in the Midwest. Let's look at another topic. A quick uh, review for 2012 on fees on forage alternatives and directions. Certainly, if you've been watching the news, uh, hay prices in Illinois, $350 a ton for imported hay. Tremendously high prices. And so we can see that forages, especially hay, is really expensive. And that's because we had less acreage this year, down about 4 to 5 percent, because people saw the higher advantage of uh, return per acre coming from uh, corn and cottonseed, actually. You've all heard in the news, our colleagues in Texas and Oklahoma having a major drought and therefore they need to import forages coming all the way from North Dakota, South Dakota, and Illinois getting down there. Distillers grains are being railed to the south because they can do that fairly economically at this stage of the game. We had trouble with first crop. When we should be cutting first crop, it was raining, and as a result, we had rain damage, we had lost some of the crop, and then it turned very, very dry in parts of the Midwest, and we lost some of our second, third, and fourth crops, or a lot lower yields just because we didn't have the moisture there at this point. And then there was some killing frost in September in parts of Minnesota, to Wisconsin that reduced corn silage yield. All these things simply say forage prices, especially for hay, are very high. So the question then comes, how low can you go? And these are guidelines. A 1% of your cow's body weight as forage, uh, a dry matter, that'd be a thir for a 1,300 pound cow, Holstein cow or herd, that'd be 13 pounds of dry matter. Generally speaking, we feed 2%. But if forages are really expensive, I can, you and I can tweak that number down. The number you cannot fool around with, you need about 19% of the forage NDF, uh, in the ration coming from forage sources. Normally that's 21 based on Wisconsin research. I think we could tweak that down to 19 and still make those cows room and function very well. However, I got to have five pounds of forage particles over one inch in length. Just got to have that. That forms the forage mat, causes rumination, leading to my five or six hundred minutes rumination. If I'm using the Penn State box, I need over 50 percent in the top two boxes. Now, some of you may have the three or four box system out there. Really, this rule doesn't change. So, I need 50 percent in the top two boxes, typically 10 percent or greater in the top box, no more than 15 to 18 percent, and somewhere over 40 percent in the middle box. I thought guideline that comes from Wisconsin is one pound of straw can replace two to three pounds of hay, primarily because the straw is very low in digestibility. It remains in the rumen longer and causes rumination and cud chewing. Now, it also takes up space, so be careful with this one, but straw could stretch if we had to some of these expensive hay resources. Now, some of us are complaining, well, what about this $350 a ton hay? Well, let's look at $250. Can I afford that? And by looking at that, the answer is yes, I can. It will increase my cost slightly. If I assumed in bullet point number one, everything I feed forage-wise comes from my dairy cows, and I'm paying about $110 a ton more, that's going to raise my cost three cents per pound of dry matter. You may want to walk through this calculation here, but we won't take the time today to, to discuss, discuss it with you. But it simply shows you it goes up to about 15 cents per pound of dry matter when today we're, we're at about 12 cents. The good news is with milk prices at 18 to $20, a pound of dry matter produces two pounds of milk. So the big profit margin is still there. Another way to look at that is the cost is about $1.44 per point, a relative forage quality index. And normally that's around a dollar. Not much I can do about that. And actually if it gets up to $300 plus dollars a ton, then this number goes over almost a dollar and fifty cents per point. So maybe this is just a new bench line we're going to have to work with. Much like we're probably not going to see $2 bush of corn anymore, you're maybe not see $0.90 cent per point relative forage quality index anymore. What I would do, however, is target that. Uh, this is actually a farmer in uh, in the Arthur area. He paid $350 a ton for his uh, forages. He feeds five pounds of this high-quality hay, took out the poor-quality hay, and discovered he got a very nice milk response on these cows, resulting in about a $0.57 cent pro profit when milk was at $19 per hundred. Strategically placing this feed actually is a very good management factor at this stage of game because anytime I get more milk from my cows, that leads to more profit. 
we then looked at Sesame. This is a software program from The Ohio State University. And we looked at what is that hay really worth? And you can see when we had corn priced at about six seventy a bushel, uh, you can see and soybean meal at three hundred thirty dollars a ton, which is close to today's milk price market prices. Then that hay is actually going to be worth about two hundred fifty dollars a ton, and that's about where it's priced. So one eighty relative feed value hay is uh, priced at two fifty. It the computer says it's worth about two hundred fifty dollars a ton. You'll see also corn silage in this example here, it is actually priced at $60 a ton, which is about 10 times the price of a bushel of corn. And you can see this computer says it's worth 85. So you can see corn silage relative to alfalfa hay is a much better buy. So certainly think about that as you look at 2012, if your forage inventories allow that. Then, of course, we've got some of this low-quality forage. Anything below 130 relative forage quality index, I think, is not high enough quality for cows. First of all, you've got to blame somebody. So blame your wife, your children, or President Obama. Any of those will work. Number two, I'm dead serious. Sell it to your neighbor. Uh, whoever feeds this to lactating cows is going to lose money. And so sell it to your neighbor. Maybe he or she wants to buy that, and then you don't have to deal with that loss. Position-wise, I treat it as straw. So I'm saying if you've got this forage on the farm, I would try to keep it below five pounds of dry matter per cow per day for higher producing cows so it doesn't take up too much room and slow down the, the nutrient intake of the cow. So I treat it almost like straw, but it's a little better than straw, obviously. The next three strategies are straightforward. Uh, feed that forage to animals that are not going to suffer in terms of loss in milk production. Low producing cows, heifers, and dry cows would be targeted gr groups here. Uh, obviously, if I could dilute that down with high quality corn silage, if it's on the farm, that's an easy answer. And or look at some byproduct feeds and corn, gluten, wheat mids here in the Midwest, beet pulp in Minnesota, citrus pulp in Florida would all be choices to dilute down this, uh, to get this low quality stuff. I don't call it forage anymore. I call it stuff and getting it out of the feeding program. Now, let's look at another aspect with 2012. What does it cost to feed cows? So here we're going to look at five different variables. They're listed here. Feed cost per day has limited value, but you've got to calculate that to get the next four. Feed cost per hundred weight of milk, and this really reflects both milk yield on your farm, shrinkage, feed losses, and feed cost. Feed cost per pound of dry matter, to me, looks at selection of feed ingredients. Powerful number. I like that one. Income over feed cost is margin. Obviously, if I do not have enough income over feed cost, then obviously I'm going to not make money. Here in Illinois, we need that number to be about $10. So this really reflects profitability. And this number is being published now by a couple of different universities, such as Penn State and Wisconsin. The magic number I love, it's not magic, it's critical, is feed efficiency. Simply sells how effective your cows convert feed into milk in terms of profitability. So let's get some benchmarks. The next PowerPoint shows the prices I used. Uh, this would be true for December, January, December 2011, January 2012. Obviously, if you're in Texas, they are not true. But this shows you the prices I'm using to generate my numbers. So these are Illinois numbers, but I would challenge you to adjust them depending on where you're living and what your situations are going to be. So I lift the price per ton on a wet basis in parentheses, and then over on the right side is cost per pound of dry matter. Those in orange are higher. In other words, those typically are not good buys and have gone up quite a bit over the last year or two. Here's my diet for that 70, 80 pound Holstein cow in general terms. Forages, green energies, protein supplements, you can see it as well. These are my estimated pounds of intake. So this cow, this cow, this group of cows, this herd of cows eating 50 pounds of dry matter. My cost, you can see per pound of dry matter. The yellow numbers are 2010. So you can see these numbers have really jumped around here and then cost per day. And so you can see it's costing me using my numbers here about $6 per cow. Now I've cheated on you in the sense that my forages are two-thirds corn silage, one-third alfalfa. You can't get there with $300 a ton hay. On the byproduct side, I've got some corn gluten feed in there. You can't get there with only with just cotton seed, for example. And on protein supplements, I am using a blend of distillers grains and soybean meal. Can't get there with straight soy, canola, or cotton seed meal from that aspect there. The yellow number on the bottom on the 5 o'clock position, $5.56. That were the prices in 2010. So you can see, yes, feed prices have gone up, and that has squeezed the profitability on dairy farms. Now, this is the take-home slide. So what are the benchmarks? So let's talk about them. Feed cost per day, there's that $6.07. 
It came from the last PowerPoint, so you see where it came from. So I got to get to that number. Then the math comes simply. Cost per pound of dry matter, 12 cents. 12.1 cent if you want to keep your decimal points there. So can you put the groceries in front of your cows for under 12 cents in Illinois? If you can, and there was a farmer at our dairy days this year who was doing it for 10 cents. He was a real shrewd buyer and locked in some interesting feedstuffs as well. Then I come down to feed cost per hundred weight. You can see for my 80 pound cow, which is my left cow, my 80 pound cow actually is a $7.60 per hundred weight. My 70 pound cow is $8.67. So very clearly that shows that less milk does not cheapen or make more money. It actually loses me money at this stage of the game. Income over feed cost with $20 milk is $12 for 80 pounds of production, $11.37 for 70 pounds of milk. So as a result, you can see I make money at $20 milk. When that milk gets down to $18, it gets snugger when it gets down to $17. My dairymen are really squeezed if there's any profit left on the table. Of course, that'll vary a great deal depending on your location and herd size and other cost factors. The number that doesn't change is on the bottom, feed efficiency. Uh, notice this has no difference in, the, in terms of price, but it simply says with 80 pounds of milk, my feed efficiency is 1.6 pounds of 3.5 fat corrected milk per pound of dry matter consumed by the cow. If I drop to 70 pounds, that feed efficiency drops to 1.4. Why is that number so important? Well, this PowerPoint shows you why it's so critical. Most farmers in the Midwest are going to be in that bottom two category, somewhere between 1.4 to 1.6 for their entire herd or groups of cows. You can see that if I can move from 1.4 to 1.6, which is a big step on feed efficiency, I generate 72 cents more profit per cow per day. What a huge number. What are some of the big factors that drive feed efficiency? Obviously, rumen acidosis is a negative. Uh, milk quality, somatic cell count is a very big factor. Uh, pregnant cows is important because we need to get higher milk production at this point. And then high quality forages because it affects dry matter intake and digestibility and source of nutrients. So this feed efficiency is going to be a num huge number. In my estimation, it's a bigger number than income over feed costs because it simply says how effective do your cows work on your farm with your feedstuffs, your diet, your management, and your uh, program out there on the dairy farm. So then look at another topic, corn alternatives. Certainly this one is carbohydrates. And so when you talk about corn, you're talking carbs. Carbohydrates make up over 70% of the ration, so it's huge. This is a source of fuel for your cow. So these are Hutchins guidelines or Illinois guidelines on carbs. You have two factors. First one's called cell wall. That's something you and I can't do as humans much with, but certainly it's critical for your cow and her microbes in her rumen for cut chewing, rumen fermentation, and bacterial growth. The numbers I want to see is neutral detergent fiber, also known as NDF, between 28 and 32%. If it is low quality forage, 28 is where I want to be. If you're using lots of good quality byproducts, you can be up at 32, 33%. The number I like is acid detergent fiber, ADF. Many feed companies, nutritionists no longer use it, but I like it because it gives me an index of digestibility of the cell wall. The number should be between 19 and 21%. Some people in Florida will cheat that number down a bit lower because they're using citrus pulp and some of those other sources as well. But in the Midwest, that's a nice number to work with. A newer number that some people like to use is lignin. I love it. Lignin is indigestible fiber, and I want to be around 3 to 4%. At our dairy days, it was very common that 10% of my farmers were feeding straw to cows. They weren't doing, they, doing that to stay forages. They were simply using that to slow down and improve rumen fermentation. So you would add straw if that number goes below 3%, and you would definitely not add straw if it's over 4%. So something called indigestible fiber, and, and that's a new concept that's coming that our dairy cows need a certain amount of that to function properly. The second part is rumen fermentable carbohydrates. These are for the microbes, for the fuel. You have three sources starch, sugar, and soluble fiber. Starch, 22 to 26%. Uh, sugars, 4 to 6%. Sugars, when such things as molasses, could be whey permeate, uh, milk byproduct. It could be a bakery byproduct. It could be candy. It could be those kinds of uh, uh, products. Pizza crust, potatoes, if you're up in Minnesota, would, would, uh, would, uh, would uh, fall in the starch area, but not in the sugar area. And then soluble fiber would be such things as what you find in beet pulp and soy hulls and citrus pulp. These are fibers that are soluble in the room and that the bacteria can actually ferment very, very aggressively. The take-home message is if you add those four three numbers up, 
starch, sugar, and soluble fiber. If you're over 40, then you have fueled those bacteria pretty well. So you hear in the research area that people feed only 22% starch. You can do that if you increase the sugar and or the soluble fiber. So that's a very powerful number to take a look at. When we look at feeding wheat right now, in January 2012, wheat is cheaper than corn. And we know wheat is worth about 10% more per pound than corn because it's higher in protein. So certainly that becomes a factor that should you be looking at alternative sources. Barley would fit in that category. Again, we don't have much barley in Illinois, but areas in New York, Minnesota, and Washington State, barley could come into a factor for the same reason. Be well aware the starch in wheat is more soluble, therefore you got to be careful on processing. It must be processed, otherwise it will come through in the feces. We suggest that if wheat is priced right, you could add 10 to 15% of the corn in the diet, replacing it with wheat, and then monitor responses. Monitor responses meaning cow talk, milk yield, milk components, dry matter intake, and fecal scores. If things look to be working well, and in fact you might see a slight increase in milk production because of the starch dynamics, then you can go up to about 20 to 30 percent of the corn replacement. Kansas State says you can go 50 percent based on their research results, but you've got to be pretty careful because everything else has to be done correctly to get that job done. Another alternative is snaplage. Again, we were seeing 5 to 8% of our farmers in Illinois this year raise their hands in our regional dairy days. Snaplage includes the ear, which includes the, the cob, the grain, the corn husk, and parts of the plant. So it becomes kind of a trashy, high-moisture corn. It is higher in fiber. It is also lower in starch. So as you work with that, you've got to be aware of that at this point. Farmers are interested in that because they increase the yield per acre by 20-15 to 25% of the dry matter because we're taking more of the plant part. Plus, we have those new choppers out there with kernel processors, these big John Deere's and Clauses that can take 10 rolls at a time, process it in the field, put it in storage, and it's ready to feed. So this convenience factor and a speed factor comes into play. Be well aware it is not shell corn. Obviously, corn cobs and husks do not have the same value of starch. It it has to be harvested wet. We like it around 40 to 45 percent dry matter at the black layer. So generally speaking, when you're done chopping corn silage, uh, you turn around and start bringing this product in fairly quickly. We think it should be inoculated with the Lactobacillus buchneri. Uh, this is a very specific bacteria that's now available to several different companies in the United States because it really impacts and reduces uh, the formation of yeast in these uh, high moisture corn type products here and stabilize, especially at feeding. And of course, there is a cost at harvest uh, to do this one. Simply, this PowerPoint looks at the differences between high moisture shell corn, high moisture ear corn, and snaplage. And you can see the dry matters are different. The starch obviously are different because of the ear or other plant parts coming into play. Notice the fibers, they will jump around. You can see snaplage and ear could be very similar depending how clean you are snapping because what's happening in most of these big kernel processor units, they're, they're putting a snapper head on. And so they're snapping the ear, which can sometimes, depending on variety and time of the day and moisture, humidity, fog and dew points can come off pretty clean at this point and the protein can jump around as well. Now here are some guidelines to take a look at uh, that we will discuss parts of uh, here but not all of them. Uh, 22 to 26 percent starch we talked about earlier. For those who are grinding corn a thousand micron for dry corn. Uh, for high moisture corn 3,000 micron and that corn has to be over 25 percent moisture. This slide says 28. I would like to be at 28 but anything over 25 you start seeing some some solubilization of the starch that makes it more available. Uh, 300 to 450 uh, milligrams rumenza per cow per day but that is herd specific. Jersey's may be a tad more sensitive to it than Holstein's. Fecal starch is below 5 or 6 percent. I don't want my starch in the manure. Uh, relative corn index over 180. More about that in a minute. And then of course the availability of starch in the rumen. This is a new measurement some of you may have heard about. Relative grain quality index, much like the forage index coming out of the University of Wisconsin. It's called RGQ, and it looks at just thing as micron size, moisture content for high moisture corn, and then we analyze it for starch analysis, the in vitro starch digestibility, a seven hour test. Uh, starches, if they are very available, will go quickly in seven hours. And prolamine is a protein found in corn. Prolamine is a protein that locks up the starch. So if you have low prolamine corn grain, then you will have more available starch. And if it's high prolamine, and that's what high moisture corn does. High moisture corn literally destroys or opens up that prolamine so it doesn't lock up your, your starch. So this is a new test. 
Uh, here are your guidelines from uh, Dairyland Labs. I believe they're with University of Wisconsin driven. And you can see for high moisture corn, you'd like to be over 88%. Obviously, wetter corn will be better than drier corn. You can see the range here. Corn silages, you can see they get higher. And of course, as corn stays in storage, this number goes up even higher. And the dry corns, you can see, are lower. So you can see dry corn has a lower there. But again, if you get the micron size down, you can also get this number to approach the 80 as well. So starch is not starch is not starch. And this simply shows there is a test out there, the, tw the uh, seven hour in vitro starch digestibility test. You and I can measure that on the farm and then adjust feeding rates and feeding programs to capture the benefits or lack of benefit with your starch levels in the diet. Level of rumenzin, uh, basically this is new data that came out. Uh, the point you can see the control, the 300 milligrams per cow per day, 450 milligrams, and then 600 milligrams per day. Notice you can see these are early lactation cows. That's important to understand. Early lactation cows, you can see a very nice response from rumenzin in terms of dry matter intake and milk production. You can see increasing here nearly four pounds. Look at the 450 though, folks. Now these are Holstein cows. You can see, look at this jump we had here. A huge jump. You can see a 13 pound jump here at this stage of the game. You can also see in terms of fat corrected milk, it stayed well. In fact, you look at the butter, um, butter fat test, you can see a slight decline with rumenzin compared to controls. But look at the milk you're getting at this stage of the game. But look at the bottom line blood ketones. Blood ketones you can see on the control cows, these are early lactation cows at 7.1. These cows are headed towards ketosis. And what does ketosis do to cows? It's a metabolic disease that lowers dry matter intake, reduces reproductive performance, and impacts herd health. Look what we do with the rumenza. It really drops it out. And that's why every lactating cow in early lactation must must get rumenzin, and you can see the high enough levels. So the take-home me message here is early lactation cows really benefit from the rumenzin, and at higher levels, we can be in better responses, and the same thing applies to mid and late lactation cows, assuming the diet can support it. And by that means what? Well, look at 600 over there. The 600 level, notice what happens? Dry matter drops down, milk drops down, butterfat test goes down. We're not seeing those benefits. So herds at high levels, and can you feed that level? Yes. Uh, FDA said you can feed up to 660 milligrams per cow per day on a, on a uh, component fed herd. And, and so you can go this high level, but the, too much can be too much. And so some herds, 300 is the right number. I have a Jersey herd in Illinois. It should be 225. There are other herds in Illinois that are at 400 and cruising along very well. But you can see a decided question at what levels and what benefits would you see feeding remains in your dairy herd. This shows you a quick slide on starch digestibility. This is from Pennsylvania, Jim Ferguson's group. And you can see on the bottom axis there, if you have 6% uh, fecal starch, uh, that line says that about 88 to 89%, 86% of the starch is going to be utilized. So on the, on the vertical column, you can see uh, that at 70% or that 0.7 to 70% apparent starch digestibility, 80%, 90%. So you can see you want fecal starches somewhere around 4 or 5% to be over that 90% number out here in the program. This is a very busy slide. We will not take much time on it today. Uh, Dave Lighty did this work here at Illinois. These are herds in the St. Louis milk market, 19 different herds. And look at the range uh, as you study this chart. You may want to go back and print this one off. He's done a nice job at the ration, which is in yellow. Uh, orange is the fecal analysis done by Rock River Lab. And then here's your starch digestibility. You can see we had some herds as low as 70. Very, boy, that's a bad place to have your starch. And the very best herd was 96. I mean, just gangbanging, doing just a wonderful, wonderful job up here. So you can see the tremendous range. On average, 85% starch digestibility. There are opportunities here to capture some additional production coming from, from the starch that's being lost in the feces. The milk response, you can see this is some work uh, from Pennsylvania. It simply shows that it should be less than uh, four and a half to five percent fecal starch, which gets you in that 90 plus percent range. But look at this one, folks. If fecal starch can be reduced by one unit, for example, going from 10 percent fecal starch to nine or six to five, their data suggests about two thirds of a pound more milk. And so we, you and I have stolen that milk from the manure. That's not a bad deal. That's not a bad deal. Well, let's look at uh, byproduct choices. This is always popular. Be well aware this is uh, being done in January of 2012. Uh, I'm looking at two software programs, Feedval 3, University of Wisconsin, 
The prices you can see were very typical for that time, six fifty a bushel, three thirty eight a ton for soya. Uh, the corn is used for an energy source. The soy is used for a protein and a rumen undegraded value here, so it does give value to both the, uh, the level of protein and the type of protein. Tallow is at forty four dollars per hundred weight. That might be a little bit low right now, but it depends on how you're buying tallow. But boy, ta oil is expensive. Uh, vegetable oil, like uh, soy oil, over fifty cents a pound. So, and limestone is in at seven dollars per hundred weight. That puts a value for calcium. So, if a feed has calcium, we give we base that off of limestone. If the feed has phosphorus, we give it credit based on dicalcium phosphate at $30 per hundredweight. So that's feed valve three. And now you'll see some very common feeds. So some of you will be disappointed if you're uh, in Minnesota. I don't have wheat bran or wheat mids there. And if you're in Florida, you're not very happy because citrus pulp isn't there. Soy hulls, you can see uh, the break-even price, uh, $208 a ton. The price then was $275. And this price just jumps all over, depending who's in the marketplace. So you can see that's not a good buy. Fuzzy cotton seed, the break-even price, three hundred forty dollars a ton. Uh, price three sixty uh, at dairy days and in the end of January, that price is coming down. Uh, I heard some prices around three hundred dollars a ton. So if you can buy for three hundred dollars a ton, then that's a good buy. However, your spot price is three sixty. It's not a good buy. Corn gluten feed is a tremendous price. You can see uh, break even two hundred forty dollars a ton. Uh, price one ninety, <clears throat> and in fact, you can get that down to one sixty if you use your trucks and go to Decatur or Clinton, Iowa, depending where your source is, because uh, one fifty five FOB was a price here on February fourth. Uh, wet Brewers Grain from St. Louis. This is a pressed Brewers Grain. Break even price ninety three. It was priced at sixty dollars a ton. And of course, if you live twenty miles from St. Louis, it's cheaper than if you're living sixty miles from St. Louis because trucking is huge. Distillers grains are really good buy again. You can see it's valued at three hundred twenty seven dollars a ton, and uh, the break even uh, uh, the break even price there and uh, price two two fifty if you're buying by bags. Again, if you take your semi and go over here to uh, to uh, Decatur or uh, Peoria, you can buy that for. 155, 160, depending on its source. So again, folks in Illinois can get these two feeds, corn, gluten, and distillers quite a bit cheaper. You'll notice <clears throat> on the left side that we do live in percentages. This is how much you, if it's priced right, and you can put it in your ration. Remember I said put it in your ration. You say, what does that mean? Well, if you've got lots of fiber in your ration, the last thing I need is soy oils. I need something that's got some more starch in it at this stage of the game. So you can swap these things out. These are our guidelines for percent of the ration dry matter. For example, 10% of soy hulls, 10 to 20% of the ration dry matter is distillers, depending on oil content. Corn gluten feed can make up 25% of the ration dry matter. In fact, wet corn gluten feed becomes an excellent forage extender as a wet replacement for corn silage or haylage, for example. Another one is to look at sesame. This comes from The Ohio State University. Uh, this one works a little differently. It looks at 30 different feed, feeds that are found, commonly found in Ohio, and then it evaluates those feeds. So if one feed goes up or down, it impacts all the rest. So it's kind of a unique program from there. Notice it looks at energy, protein, and fiber. It does not look at fat, does not look at minerals. So obviously the two programs look at different feeds a little differently. So if you look at this PowerPoint, you can see, for example, distillers, it has a lower value. Ours was around $340 a ton. This is 317 because it doesn't differentiate between oil as a source of energy than it does starch. So again, you can again see some of these numbers we talked about earlier. Here you can see some of the forages and your other uh, listed there. Fuzzy cottonseed gets hurt a little bit because it doesn't see the oil in there. My guideline is when you get Holstein cows over 70 pounds of milk, I need the oil as an alternate energy source uh, to make some space in the feeding program out there on your farms. So in summary, here are some take home messages. High producing cows will be a key solution to any of our challenges. We never give up milk. So as a result, do not reduce milk production. Second, know your dairy metrics. What is it costing you to produce milk in Illinois or Florida or in Wisconsin? Don't cheat the rumen. These bacteria ferment high quality proteins and energies for your higher producing dairy cows. And finally, look at alternative feeds, forages, byproducts, and additives out there. Well, that completes our program for today. Thanks. Have a great day.